This conference will now be recorded. So hello everyone and welcome. Thank you so much for being here today for our presentation on post mastectomy pain syndrome. Um, this was a highly requested webinar. Um, education is so important, so I'm so happy to see all of you taking the time to invest in yourself um, and your client's care. So bravo to all of you. My name is Jennifer Wang, the president of Paradigm Medical. I also have Franz Foster here with me today. She has over 20 years of breast care experience um, and is our education specialist. She's just a wealth of knowledge, so don't hesitate to ask any questions. Franz, do you wanna just say hello to everyone? Absolutely. Welcome everyone for attending this webinar. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, so a couple little things. I think everyone's uh, pretty good. So just mute your device, camera, um, and as well, if you have any questions, there's a little chat function on the top sort of right hand corner of your screen. It's like a little dialogue box. Um, feel free to type in any questions that you might have. Uh, Franz or I will be monitoring um, that chat room. So uh, we'll be sure to answer any of your questions. And so Paradigm Medical, we are a national medical products distributor specializing in post mastectomy breast care, lymphedema, and orthopedic footwear and foot care products. It is our mission to provide great medical products to underserved markets in Canada. We believe that all people should have access to great medical products. Most notably, you will know us as the exclusive Canadian distributor of American Breast Care, uh, Bile Compression Systems, which is the manufacturer of the lymphedema pump, uh, Podewell, Pedors, Oasis, iRunner, Veramed, and Go Seamless lines. Um, footwear and foot care lines. Uh, we are a Canadian business, woman owned, um, and we serve all of Canada and have been doing so for well over 25 years. So there's a picture of some of the team members there on your bottom right hand corner um, and all our contact information if you do need us uh, to reach us. Uh, we're super friendly, we pick up the phone, uh, so don't hesitate to give us a call or send us an email um, or fax. And you can also check us out on uh, social media too as well. Uh, we'll be recording this presentation and posting it on our YouTube website. So for any of you who need to reference it um, after the fact, um, we can, uh, it's available for you. So today we will be covering the topic of post mastectomy pain syndrome. Um, what it is, the prevalence, symptoms, causes, um, how to manage and treat it, um, what are some of the options, um, your role um, as a fitter um, or a healthcare professional, um, and what sort of products will help manage uh, the pain. Um, disclaimer, uh, this webinar is not intended uh, for the purposes of providing medical advice. Our web webinar is uh, for informational purposes only. Uh, please seek uh, professional medical advice. And with that, I will pass it over to Franz. Thank you, Jennifer. All right, so today's webinar is on post mastectomy pain syndrome. So if we could have uh, the next slide, Jennifer. Okay, so post, let, let's start with the definition of uh, post mastectomy pain syndrome. Uh, basically, it's a chronic neuropathic pain disorder that can occur following breast cancer related procedures. So um, the way that it's actually diagnosed is um, through uh, a process of elimination. So when, a, uh, when persistent pain lasts beyond three months post-surgery, uh, it could be an indication that this is PMPS. Uh, so again, it's reached by process of elimination. And uh, it's totally different from, uh, so it should not be confused with complex 
regional pain syndrome or phantom breast pain, which are two, two different um, types of pain altogether. Uh, complex, complex regional pain syndrome is actually a broad term that is described to, um, uh, that describes excess and prolonged pain and inflammation that follows an injury to the arm or the leg. And this is something that you would typically feel after surgery, whereas phantom breast syndrome is a, a condition where a patient has a sensation of a residual breast tissue. So it feels like the breast is still there and it can include both non-painful sensations as well as phantom breast pain. So let's delve into that a little bit more. Prevalence of uh, PMPS, I'm gonna use PMPS instead of saying post-mastectomy pain syndrome just because it's so long. Um, so this persistent pain uh, can affect up to 60% of patients. Um, so this was actually first noticed in women that had mastectomies but it can also happen after other types of breast conserving surgeries. So it could be a lumpectomy. It could also be um, a breast reduction surgery. So any type of surgery that affects that, that outer, upper outer quadrant of the, uh, of the breast tissue, this is, where, um, this is where it occurs the most, most often. So that, that upper portion. And there's, uh, there are some, factors that make a person more susceptible to this type of chronic pain, but we're going to cover that a little bit later. Symptoms of post-mastectomy pain syndrome uh, can be pain and tingling in the chest wall, in the armpit, in the arm itself, in the shoulder. It can also have uh, the pain in the surgical scar area. It can also be uh, manifests itself as numbness, as well as shooting or pricking pain, or intense itching. The pain can be mild, moderate, or severe. It may radiate to the shoulder, the scapula, or the shoulder blade, the axilla, or underarm area, as well as the upper arm area. It can present itself with or without problems related to shoulder function. Now, when people have pain in the shoulder, they, they tend to not move the shoulder. So that can, um, that can cause other issues. And the pain can also be associated with other neuro neurological symptoms, uh, which are sensory deficit. So a sensory deficit is a general medical term that um, covers a wide range of symptoms, which can include difficulties with one of the main senses, could be touch, could be taste, or difficulties with multiple senses. Now, other secondary or, or associated symptoms related to PMPS can be muscle weakness of the affected extremity and loss of shoulder function. So when we talk about both of those, um, uh, they can be caused by the inability of movement immediately after surgery, which is a common occurrence. And without physio, it can become a long-term issue. So it's important to address those. Uh, rotator cuff dysfunction is, um, is a disorder that causes pain and weakness in the shoulder. It can be uncomfortable or impossible to do everyday activities. You know, simple things like combing your hair, tucking in your shirt, or reaching above your head. Most often, you'll feel uh, the person will feel the pain on the side and front of the upper arm and shoulder, and this is treated with um, non-steroidal non anti-inflammatory drugs, physical therapy, and sometimes steroid injection. Adhesive capsulitis um, can also is also known as frozen shoulder. This is a very painful condition, and uh, obviously, it means you lose motion in the shoulder. This can, this can be um, caused by an injury. It may arise gradually without any warning. Um, and in frozen shoulder, you, you have inflammation in the joint, which makes the normally loose parts of the joint capsule stick together. So this seriously limits the shoulder's ability to move and cause the shoulder to freeze. 
Braxial plexopathy is a form of peripheral neuropathy, so damage to the nerves, um, and it occurs when there's uh, damage to the actual brachial plexus, which is a network of nerves in the shoulder that carries movement and sensory signals from the spinal cord to the arms and hands. This is an area on each side of the neck where nerve roots from the spinal cord split into each arm's nerves. So when there's damage to this area, um, it's, it can be caused by direct injury to the nerve. It can be caused by stretching injuries, by pressure from tumors in the area, uh, especially from lung tumors, or damage that result from radiation therapy. There are also other uh, secondary and associated symptoms. Uh, one very uh, prevalent one is called axillary web syndrome, and I know that a few people have asked about this, uh, this uh, condition as well as a symptom, secondary sy symptom to PMPS. It's also known as cording, tethering, or banding. So if you hear those terms, it, it kind of all relates together. It's a condition that may happen in the arm, armpit, trunk, or breast after surgery and after treatment for breast cancer. So what you would typically see here is thick or thin bands or cords in the armpit, which may run down the arm. And it feels like a web of thick rope-like structures under the skin. This is physical pain, so it's not really originating from a nerve, but it's also not always a secondary symptom to PMPS. It can occur uh, outside of that, uh, sometimes develops as a side effect of sentinel lymph node biopsy where only a few nodes are removed to check for cancer, or the axillary lymph node dissection, where a lot of nodes are removed, up to 10 to 14. So the resulting scar tissue from that type of surgery to the chest area, uh, which is to remove cancer, can contribute to a cause in cording or axillary web syndrome. Typically occurs anywhere from several days to several weeks after surgery, although there's, there have been individual cases where it can appear many, many months later. The cords tend to be painful and tight, which make it difficult for a person to lift their arm any higher than the shoulder or to extend the elbow fully. This pain and limited range of motion can have a major impact on day-to-day -day life, so physiotherapy is very much required to regain full mobility. Lymphedema is the next one. It's a buildup of fluid and soft body tissues when the lymphatic system is damaged or blocked. And uh, this uh, can occur when you have breast surgery as well. The lymphatic system is a network of lymph vessels, tissues, organs that carry lymph fluid throughout the body. And uh, so uh, lymphedema occurs when the lymph is not able to flow through the body the way that it should. There are also other uh, other types such as neuroma. So if there's a neuroma in the breast, it's a um, benign hyperplastic response when a nerve is transected. So when they dissect the nerve, uh, it means that it's, uh, hyperplastic means that it's it, there's a number of increased cells. So it's what it is, it's creating a palpable nodule uh, in or near the surgical car, scar, sorry, and is also frequently painful. However, this is a, a very rare occurrence after breast surgery. And we also touched a little bit on phantom breast syndrome already. So where a condition, it's a condition where patients have a sensation of breast tissue that remains, although it's not there anymore. And it, it can include both non-painful sensations as well as phantom breast pain. Um, it's very similar to patients who have a leg or foot or a limb removed, so phantom limb pain, where um, they, they, they still feel pain and discomfort, itching, pins and needle sensations, tingling, pressure, burning and throbbing in, in, the, um, uh, in the affected area, so the, the uh, tissue or, or limb that has been removed. And finally, complex regional pain syndrome is, is simply a broad term that describes excess and prolonged pain and inflammation that follows an injury to an arm or leg. Other symptoms as well are mental health. 
So this includes emotional, psychological, and social well-being. Things like a person's inability to work or difficulty in making decisions or thinking clearly. It affects how we think, how we feel, how we act. It helps determine how we handle stress, how we relate to others, and how we make healthy choices. So mental health is really important at every stage of life, from childhood to adulthood. Um, so that can manifest itself in terms of mental health. And again, uh, other things that can occur is fatigue after, uh, after going through the stress of um, surgery and also sexual dysfunction is also another side effect. Next, we're going to talk about the causes of PMPS. Now, this pain is most likely neuropathic in nature because of a peripheral nerve injury, which occurs in the armpit and chest during surgery. And it's it's very frequently the ICVN, so the intercostal brachial nerve that is implicated, but uh, there could also be smaller unmyelin unmyelinated nerve fibers that could be a culprit to, for that moderate to severe pain. So unmyelinated just means that the fibers uh, typically have a myelin sheath, which is a coating that found on nerves, but if that's missing or it's been eroded or has disappeared, it, it can cause the pain. So more specifically, the ICBN is that cut, uh, cutaneous nerve, which occurs from the lateral branch of the second intercostal nerve, so you see the two, three, four in, numer in Roman numerals there. So from the second, um, the second intercostal nerve, and it provides sensation to the lateral chest, the axilla, and the medial upper arm. And it courses through the superficial breast tissue, lateral chest, axilla, and post posterior medial aspect of the arm. So that's why that pain is felt in this area. There's other numerous potential causes of PMPS besides injury to nerves. Things like uh, neuromas, fibrosis, and incisional pain can occur. So we talked a little bit about neuromas already um, in a previous slide where um, a palpable nodule can develop. But again, that's a, that's a rare occurrence. Fibrosis uh, means that the breast tissue develops a scar-like texture and it's, it feels firm and rubbery. So it, that can lead to a development of fluid-filled uh, sacs or cysts, and uh, there becomes more prominent fibrous tissue there, which can make breast feel tender, lumpy, or ropey. And uh, additionally, me mechanical or tensile strength to peripheral nerves can result in pain due to peripheral and central sensitivity sensitization. You'll see in the image there that, uh, uh, so this just demonstrates that tensile strength that's applied longitudinally, so in, in lengthwise, to a peripheral nerve creates an elongation of the nerve and increase in the strain on the nerve. So that contraction um, during the elongation is greatest in the middle of the section undergoing tensile stress. So that's what causes the pain. Next, we have post-surgical adhesions and hematomas, <clears throat> which can contribute to PMPS by simple mechanical irritation of the local muscle, the fascia, uh, neural structures that can cause somatic and visceral pain. Uh, Post-operative uh, adhesions are path pathological bonds that form between surfaces within body cavities. So, um, and they typically begin to form within the first few days after surgery, but they may not produce symptoms for months or even years. Uh, as far as post-operative radiotherapy, um, the, uh, they may lead to the development of PMPS by inducing local neuritis, myonecrosis, or fibrosis. Uh, neur uh, neuritis is a, a term to describe inflamed peripheral nerves, 
and myonecrosis is a condition of necrotic damage specific to muscle tissue. So those, those could all be causes of PMPS. Now, if, um, if someone has pre-existing causes, um, meaning that a person can be more likely to have persistent post-mastectomy pain, including pain from swelling and musculoskeletal pain due to, their, due to certain factors such as age, race or ethnicity, the type of treatment they received, their mental health, or previously experienced pain. So we're just gonna to touch on a few of these. So in terms of age, uh, while there's no specific age bracket, age bracket associated with having PMPS versus not, um, there was actually a, um, a review, a research review in the Canadian Medical Association Journal that found that younger age showed a greater likelihood of persistent pain. So according to the article, a woman who is 40 may have a higher risk of post-mastectomy persistent pain than a woman who is 60, which is an interesting, um, an interesting, uh, interesting, I don't know what I'm saying, <laughs> an interesting uh, point. Um, next is uh, race or ethnicity. So it's, it's been found that racial and ethnic minorities are more likely to experience persistent uh, PMPS, possibly because specific groups such as African Americans and Hispanics tend to be diagnosed at a more advanced stage of breast cancer. So that could be because of hesitancy to seek medical advice or for cultural reasons. Um, but that just makes them more susceptible to PMPS. It can also be based on the type of treatment that the patient received. Uh, so if they have a surgery that removed tissue in the upper outside portion of the breast or the underarm area, and uh, if they have um, undergone an axillary lymph node dissection, or ALND, which removes up to 10 to 14 lymph nodes to check for cancer. And also if the patient has received radiation therapy after surgery. So those can all call, all increase the risk of getting PMPS. There's also some evidence that having a condition like anxiety or depression prior to surgery can increase the likelihood that a person will have persistent pain after so this is according to the Journal of Pain. And also if a person has pre-existing pain, um, such as headaches or low back pain uh, in, you know, pre previous to the operation, there's a chance that they will have, you know, there's a greater chance that they will have persistent post-surgery pain. Now let's talk about ways to manage PMPS and what treat treatment options are available. So when a person is experiencing these symptoms following breast surgery, it's important that they talk to their physician as soon as possible. Um, it can cause a person to not use their arm the way they should, and over time, they eventually lose the ability to use it normally. So, um, so they need to address this with a physician to learn about treatment options. And they may need medications that work for nerve pain. So standard painkillers or strong opioids don't work well for this type of pain. The goal is to get them to, to get them the help they need to be as comfortable as possible during the recovery period. So it's really important to, uh, to address this. Um, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories may help other types of discomfort, but they won't work on nerve pain. So that's why it's important to talk to a physician about these conditions. When this is left untreated, it may not only be painful, but it may also affect the use of the arm, its range of movement, while also impairing that patient's mental health.
for treatments, uh, physical therapy and exercises is, you know, the number one choice um, because it's regarded as a neuropathic disorder and it can also affect musculoskeletal dysfunction and myofascial pain, which can contribute to chronic PMPS. So physical therapy programs uh, using st strengthening exercises and massage are helpful in improving shoulder pain by reducing myofascial trigger points. Uh, medications. Obviously, uh, things like antidepressants and anti-epileptic medications, um, that is what is used for nerve pain. So they're, they are, yes, they're used to treat depression and epilepsy, but they are also used to treat PMPS. There's also another option, which is topical capsaicin, which is uh, uh, a product applied to the skin in the form of an, an ointment or cream or other substance. And this is found, in, uh, this, this compound, capsaicin, is found in chili peppers and works by decreasing activity and therefore decreasing the sensation of pain in nerve cells. Then uh, they can go to, uh, to ex you can accelerate this and use things like nerve blocks and neurolysis. Um, so, Trigger point injections are, are dispensed by your healthcare professional and they insert a small needle into identified and specific trigger points along the chest wall or spinal nerve. And uh, so nerve blocks, and so nerve blocks is, as the name implies, it, it, it blocks, blocks um, sensation to the nerve while a neurolysis is a, an injection of a ster steroid or saline around a peripheral nerve in the upper or lower extremity to alleviate symptoms of pain or numbness. So this, these procedures can reduce or eliminate pain. They're not all long-term though. Um, some of them have short-term effects. So the one of them, the thoracic paravertebral nerve blocks have shown immediate but short-term pain relief lasting less than a month in most patients. Whereas a neurolysis with ster steroid injection uh, may offer less profound, but longer lasting pain relief, which can last up to six months. So there are a couple of emerging um, treatment options uh, that have been, that have been uh, tried. And one of them is called autologous fat grafting. So for those that are familiar with um, breast reconstruction a little bit. Um, we'll, we'll have an idea of what autologous fat, gra uh, autologous breast, reconstru breast reconstruction is. It, um, so breast reconstruction, uh, autologous breast reconstruction means that they are using that person's own tissue. So it could be muscles, could be fat uh, to reconstruct a breast. So in the same token, fat grafting taking, uh, extracting fat from a different area of the body, purifying it, and then injecting the fat into, uh, into the painful areas uh, may reduce pain because it provides cushioning. And it also has a natural anti-inflammatory effect on the tissue around it. Um, so it, it's, it's a well-established surgical technique uh, used in plastic surgery. Uh, it helps to restore deficient tissue but uh, more recently, it's known for its regenerative properties. Um, so clinical use of fat grafts for breast reconstruction in tissues damaged by radiotherapy first provided clues to drive tissue regeneration. And um, so healthy fat introduced into irradiated tissues appear to reverse radiation injury, such as fibrosis, scarring, contracture, and pain. So fat cells may very well hold the secrets to combating these conditions in the future. So we'll see what happens with that. <clears throat> also, um, the autologous breast reconstruction is also emerging in terms of uh, treating PMPS. Uh, so you get, 
<clears throat> excuse me. So there's some abnormal scarring of the chest wall sometimes and uh, in the chest wall and armpit following breast cancer surgery, which can lead to stiffness, decreased mobility, but it also may compress local peripheral nerves. So they can go in and surgically remove the scar tissue and <clears throat> when combined with reconstruction using a person's own tissue, they may actually help decompress those nerves and provide relief. So another emerging technique here. There are also some integrative treatments that uh, a person can look at, such as acupuncture, yoga, and massage. Now, patients suffering from PFP, PMPS may find some relief with these um, alternative or integrative treatments, but researchers are still looking at whether these and other therapies are helpful to nerve-related pain. So it's always important to discuss these ideas with the care team and ask for referrals to providers that are experienced with PMPS. And now I'll pass this on back to uh, to Jennifer. Thank you, Franz. Okay, so what does this all mean to you as a healthcare professional, as a patient? You know, what does this mean? Um, what can you do um, to help um, you know uh, alleviate some of the pain? And um, you know, so first thing first is to you know if you're during your appointments. Um, as a fitter, uh, as a as a nurse, um, listen for clues. Um, you know, listen for clues that the patient may be experiencing some uh, symptoms related to post mastectomy pain. Um, if you suspect this, um, do not give any medical device, but please do recommend them contact their physician as soon as possible. As you, as you are aware from Franz's um, uh, wonderful description, um, it can be complicated. So you want to make sure that they are seeking the advice of a physician uh, to fully understand um, their condition. Uh, so there are some products um, that are recommended for this specific type of condition, and we're going to go through what those features are. What are the things that you want to be looking for as a patient and as a fitter to help manage the pain um, of uh, PMPS? So number one, you want to be looking for um, bras, garments that are made with soft fabrics that are well-lined. Um, so that you're not causing any type of irritation um, in, the, uh, in the chest area or under the arm, um, and so that the, the client and patient uh, feels comfortable. Um, you want non-restricting um, garments uh, to avoid any pressure on the sensitive areas. Um, and most importantly, you want to make sure that um, clients are coming in for a proper fitting, um, so they're getting fitted for supported, supportive and properly fitting bra and breast prosthesis. This will prevent any rubbing or chafing um, or any further discomfort um, because if the bra and the prosthesis is not properly fitted, this will cause any type of shifting and movement and cause further discomfort. Um, in general, uh, patients um, and clients should be coming in every six months or so for fitting. Um, their condition might change. Um, and they might be someone like me who throws their bras in the washing machine. So um, you're not going to get the length of wear that you need um, from them. So you need to come in more regularly to get fit uh, for a new um, um, set of bras. Um, or their weight could have changed. Um, their medical condition could have changed. So you want to make sure that you're seeing them regularly so that they're, um, they're properly fitted for the right garments. So now we'll review some of uh, the products that are suitable for patients um, with this um, condition. So very, very important. Um, this is something that I know um, 
Um, unfortunately, patients are not made aware of um, pre-op or, or what we call post-op garments, um, generally until after the surgery has taken place. Um, so this is our mission. We're going to try and really, really hammer this home so that all patients know that prior to surgery, um, they should be going in um, and being fitted um, for um, these post-op garments. Um, these uh, garments will be worn approximately six weeks after surgery. Uh, they're very important because they help reduce swelling. They help to speed up the wound healing process. Um, so immediately after surgery, a nurse should be putting these garments on them. So they should have them available um, uh, to uh, provide the nurse or their healthcare provider before they go into surgery so that it can be placed on them immediately afterwards um, because not wearing a post-op bra can cause the wound to heal poorly. Um, not having the compression and the stabilizing aspect of the post-op garments can also um, um, cause uh, more scarring. So what's happening is um, any kind of movement um, in the breast tissue uh, where it's not stable will cause micro tearing. Um, and as a result, that could lead to a thicker um, hypertrophic scar. So you wanna make sure that these garments are um, available to the, to the patients before they go into surgery so that they can get it um, put on them uh, immediately afterwards. So some of our top selling um, post-op garments, uh, the 519 compression bra, uh, this is one of our top sellers. Uh, it's made with um, a cotton blend, so it's super soft material. It's very comfortable. Um, it's got the reinforced side panels um, to give really good compression and support. Um, it helps to stabilize um, the breast tissue, so it allows for um, quicker uh, wound healing, and as well, it will help minimize any um, potential scarring. Uh, this also comes with a uh, compression brand separately, um, if you're interested. Um, it's got nice wide straps, and you've got uh, um, uh, adjustability there too as well. Uh, this is also available uh, in a non-molded version uh, for men who are going through chest surgeries or for women who prefer flat surgeries. Uh, this is also a garment that a lot of patients with lymphedema uh, love. Another great option um, for post-op garment is the 520 Active Recovery Bra. Um, this is um, similar to the 519. Uh, but this is made out of nylon and spandex blend. Uh, so for those who also are a little bit more active and um, like something um, that's um, a little bit more stretchy, uh, this is a great option. Uh, so similar, it's got um, you know the seamless fabric. Um, it's great for patients with lymphedema too as well. It's got the zip front, so for people who have challenges um, with mobility in the arms, um, it's got the adjustable um, straps, the hook and eye straps here, so it's, um, it sits very nicely um, under the clothing, uh, and it's got really great coverage under the arm and in the back, so it keeps everything in, stable, um, it helps um, minimize any swelling, and then it keeps the wound um, area uh, nice and compressed so that it will promote wound healing, and it's just a very, very comfortable bra. Uh, so for women who like a little bit more coverage, I know my mother-in-law is one um, that she wants something that's just going to be more of a, a camisole. Um, this is our most popular, the 952 zip front post-surgical camisole. It comes with a drain management kit, which means that you've got two Velcro attachable drain pouches and two puffs. Uh, this is also a cotton and spandex mix, so it's very breathable. It's very, very soft. It's got the zip front so it's and the, um, and the clasps at the shoulder, so it's really easy to put on and off if you, you, know, if you have some challenges um, with mobility. Um, and it's just very soft um, material. It's lined very beautifully inside, uh, so it's going to um, 
be a great option for people who have very sensitive skin and with irritations. And all the zippers and the, it's lined well, so there's there's padding to protect the skin. And so for clients and patients who, um, you know, uh, this is this is a great option, the 932 Active Form um, for clients who want a little bit of um, who would like a little bit of shape, um, but this is only something that we would recommend for someone who has their surgical site has healed, healed, so after the surgical site is healed, but before they're ready for a, like a full silicon prosthesis, um, this is a really, really great option as kind of for that in-between stage. Um, it's very lightweight, it's made with these lightweight micro beads. Uh, it shapes nicely to the bra cup. Um, it's fast drying, so if there's still some, um, you know, if you, it needs to be washed on a regular basis, um, you know, uh, this is a good in-between option. Um, so it gives you a little bit of shape. Obviously, it's not going to give you um, um, the more natural shape of what a full silicon prosthesis would, but this is that in-between step where you need something really, really lightweight um, and uh, something that'll provide some shape. Um, and uh, it's easy to wash. Uh, women use this um, for as an active form. So when you're swimming, when you're, you know, exercising, um, it also comes with a great um, waterproof travel bag for those who, um, who are, uh, you know, uh, need to throw in their swimsuits or exercise clothing and whatnot. Um, this is a, a really, really lovely option for that in-between stage. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna go through um, some products for after the surgical site has healed, but we're gonna divide it into sort of two pieces. You're gonna have those um, clients who are or, or um, patients in the mild to moderate stage um, who have sort of mild to moderate pain, and then for those who have moderate to severe pain, because it's gonna be two different types of products uh, and the features that you'll be looking for. Uh, so for those who have more mild to moderate pain, you have some more options. Um, but really what you're looking for is soft to mild compression. Um, you want really soft, comfortable fabrics, um, you know, things that are really well lined, um, fabric covered zippers or, um, um, or bands or anything like that. Um, so nothing that's going to cause any irritation. Um, most importantly, you want to ensure that the bra and the breast prosthesis are not only supported, but properly fitting. Uh, so you want to make sure that you're going in for those fittings every six months or so. This will prevent, once again, any rubbing or chafing and shifting, which will cause discomfort. So the top selling bra um, in Canada um, is the 525 massage bra. We cannot keep enough of this in stock. Like women just love, love, love this bra. It's constructed with this beautiful textured fabric uh, that provides a cooling and breathable. Um, it's massage-like is what we hear from, from a lot of women. Um, so it's just really, really comfortable. It's seamless. Um, and uh, so it's great, uh, very versatile to wear under all types of clothing. It's got nice padded um, straps uh, to provide a really comfortable fit. It's, uh, the straps are also a little bit wider, uh, so it's really supportive. Um, it's just a really excellent fitting bra. It fits the majority of women and they just love it. And it just recently came out in this um, beautiful light pink here. Um, and it's just, we like I said, we just can't keep enough of it in stock here. Uh, women love, love, love this bra. So if you're looking for something that's a little bit more elegant, um, another popular one is the 511 Regalia bra. This is really great for larger sizes. Um, it goes all the way up to a G cup. It's designed with a three-part cup, uh, so it's really great support. Um, it's also got that beautiful floral um, embroidered detail, so it gives it that really nice and elegant look. Um, you know, also nice straps um, along the shoulder. It's got great coverage under the arm too as well. 
a really beautiful, beautiful option um, for women who are looking for more of that elegant look. So for petite women, um, this is the best fitting uh, petite bra on the market. Um, the 105 uh, petite t-shirt bra. It's uh, seamless molded foam cups. However, it's also got that really beautiful lace detailing around the band and then the straps. Um, it just fits so well for petite women. And I know in certain parts of the country, you've got a lot of um, women who are more on the petite side, um, whether it be just the Asian demographic or, or whatnot, and they really love the fit of this bra. Um, it's just beautiful. So for women who are looking for a little bit more coverage, um, the 503 Embrace Bra is extremely popular. It's got the higher neckline, so it provides more coverage, whether it be for you know surgical scars, um, some women just want a little bit more coverage there. It's got good um, high side panels to give you extra um, coverage under the arm. Um, it's uh, uh, got um, it's made of a beautiful cotton uh, material, uh, so it's uh, very ultra soft, um, but also has that lovely lace detail on top, so you can double it as a camisole, um, and it's just really, really uh, a comfortable bra. Um, there is no um, back closure on this on this uh, bra, so if any of your um, any of the clients or patients have um, some mobility issues, um, then this might not be the one for you. But otherwise, this is a lovely, lovely option. So our top selling um, breast prostheses in Canada are the uh, 10275 uh, massage form. Um, you see these specialized channels. Um, they encourage airflow, so it helps to reduce the heat retention in the breast forms, especially during these hot um, uh, and steamy uh, Canadian uh, summers. Um, so it provides a very soothing touch. It's also got a fuller back, so it hugs the chest wall beautifully, and it's so comfortable. Um, the uh, super soft, lightweight silicone is just so comfortable and very, very natural um, uh, and very similar to your natural breast tissue. Um, it's also uh, made with the lightweight silicone, uh, so it's lighter um, and will help minimize any tension on the shoulder, um, so for a really nice, comfortable wear. Uh, the um, triangle shape is also uh, one that fits the majority of women. It's got a great size range and it comes in both the um, blush and then the tawny color too as well. Um, so that's a great option for women. So for women who are really sensitive to the weight, um, we would recommend the 10271 Classic Triangle Air. This is the lightest full silicone breast prosthesis on the market. Um, it's made with our ultra light air silicone. Um, so it will minimize um, any uh, strain for women who have any shoulder or back issues or pain, um, or just are very sensitive to weight. Um, this is the option for them. Um, if they're looking for like a full silicone breast prosthesis, but want something that's really ultra lightweight. Um, keep in mind though, when you go lighter weight, um, you tend to lose um, more of the, uh, the softness um, of the breast prosthesis. So this prosthesis will be lightweight, but it'll be a little bit more structured. Um, it'll be a little bit more firm than, um, and than uh, say the 10275, the one that I spoke about earlier. Uh, so once again, after the surgical site has healed, um, for patients or clients who have more moderate to severe pain, they're going to be looking at different features in terms of the um, garments and prostheses uh, that we would recommend for them. Um, so number one would be they would likely need a front closure bra. Um, or they might like uh, prefer something that's what we call a step-in bra, uh, where you would pull the bra in over your feet and pull it up. 
Um, they'll also need something obviously soft with mild compression, um, a soft, comfortable fabrics, good lining. Um, any type of zippers need to be covered. Um, uh, they'll probably need the lightest weight breast forms. Um, and once again, so important, uh, you want to make sure that they're coming in every six months to be properly fitted um, for their bras and breast prostheses. So here's just um, a few options here. We'll go through them in detail. Um, so one that's very, very popular um, that women love is the 110 Leisure. Uh, this is great for post-surgical, uh, for anyone who deals with pain and discomfort, mobility constraints, because it's got the front closure, or for those women who just want it as a leisure wear, because it's got more of a relaxed fit. It's made um, with a cotton and spandex blend. Uh, so it's very breathable, very soft, um, uh, natural material against the skin. It's got the front closure, wide straps. It comes in a ton of different beautiful patterns and colors. It also has the matching panties. Um, so this is a very popular option. Uh, so for those women who love the features of the 110, but um, would prefer um, adjustable straps because the 110 the straps are not adjustable um, you might have a longer sort of chest area which i would fall in that category you probably need something adjustable um, uh, we would recommend the 130 molded leisure bra so once again great for post-surgical for anyone with pain or discomfort um, mobility issues because it's got the front closure um, it's also made with the breathable cotton and spandex, um, and it's got a very um, relaxed and comfortable fit. Uh, once again, the 520 active recovery bra would be a great option for, for patients who are dealing with, you know, more of a moderate to severe pain. Um, just very comfortable. You've got that nice stretchy fabric with compression. Um, and um, it, uh, it'll be uh, all the zippers and lined um, areas are lined very nicely, so you're not gonna have any um, irritation from those areas. Um, some step-in bra options. You've got the 131 Comfy Bra. These are all made, uh, both of these are made with a nylon and spandex blend. Um, so very lightweight fabrics. Um, it's made from like a knitted fabric. Um, where um, it just contours to the body very nicely. So you get a nice, smooth, seamless um, finish. Uh, it's also very soft. Um, it's very stretchy, so you can um, pull these um, and step into these bras. Um, the 131 comes with adjustable straps. The 136 does not, but it has wider straps for those who are looking for more support. The 131, you can also um, adjust the strap. So you can do a cross back and you can, um, you can even take them off if you needed to. So for those who um, are um, finding the weight uh, a concern, then, you know, like I spoke with before, the 10271 Classic Triangle Air uh, would be the option for them because it's the lightest, lightest uh, full silicone breast prosthesis. Um, another option where you're not going to get the same um, shape, but um, you're going to get some shape. But for those who are just super, 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 super sensitive, uh, then um, the 932 active form might be um, the best option for them just because it's um, of the weight uh, of it um, might be more suitable. All right. So that is our presentation today. Thank you everyone um, for your attention and um, for your interest. Um, we are so happy to be able to put this uh, webinar on for you today because we, like I mentioned, education is so super important. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to, um, to reach out to us. Here's all our, cover, um, our um, excuse me, uh, contact information. Um, if you have any feedback or other topics that you would like us to cover in the future, please let us know. Um, 
Also, if any of you are interested in um, becoming a mastectomy fitter, we offer a training program. Uh, so um, if that's of interest, um, reach out to uh, Mina or uh, Sandra and um, <coughs> they can uh, set you up uh, with the training program. Any questions in the interim? Well, we have uh, everyone here. Actually, there's a question from Tanya Davis. Uh, she asked, which compression bra would be most um, most uh, appropriate for someone who has one breast removed? Um, either of the two. So let me flip back to these compression bras here. Uh, so either of them would be great. Um, so you've got um, pockets in both of the, all of our bras have pockets, they come with pockets. So whether it be the 520 or the 519, um, they come with pockets. So you'll be able to slide, whether it be a puff initially, um, while the surgical site is still healing. Um, but after say the six week period is generally, it might take longer, it might take less time, but generally once the surgical site is healed, um, then you could look at, um, fitting them for a full um, silicone breast form. Or if they are still not comfortable with that, then maybe um, the 932 active form might be a good in between -y. But all the bras come with um, pockets in both, um, in both breasts. So uh, you shouldn't have a problem, um, whether it be right or left. Does that answer the question? I believe so. I believe, uh, yes, and Tanya said she would be interested in a fitting education session. Okay, yeah, so reach out um, for the, uh, uh, you can reach out to Mina at info. Let me just pull up her contact information. Okay. So Mina here at info at paradigmmed.com, she will, um, she'll be able to uh, set you up with the training. And uh, Colette asks if she can get a copy of the research uh, cited regarding autologous breast reconstruction and fat grafting, and that's in the slide. So I believe we're making these available to Yes, so we'll all quickly go back, but we are recording this presentation, so we'll, uh, make that available on our YouTube site, but here we go. So here's the um, citation right there. Colette, if you wanna take that down. Maxine has asked, is there any an initial clinic order that you suggest for samples? Yeah, Maxine, so Mina, when you contact Mina, she'll be able to help you with that. Um, she can help you put together um, an initial sort of order based on sort of the type of clients that you see. Um, absolutely. So once again, if you reach out to the ladies, um, either Sandra or Mina, um, here's their contact information. They'll be able to assist you with anything, any questions that you might have. Thank you for your comments. Thank you so much, ladies, Maxine and Colette. No further questions. All right, so we will end the recording now. Thank you.